Hello and welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan. I'm a co-host, Patrick Farrell, as always. Paddy, how are you? I am positively splendid, Gary. It's been a good week. The The year is off to a good start. We're ticking away nicely. I don't have any complaints, which is good. Glad to hear it. I'm I'm sure. Can't complain. Fantastic. Now, we did spend uh, a lot of time before this call uh, chatting shit between ourselves, so... Uh, we're a little bit behind our general schedule, so we're going to try to get this podcast done relatively quickly because I am aware, Gary, that you do have to go to Jiu-Jitsu after this. We shouldn't um, need to leave out any details. It's a it's a pretty, it's a topic that I think we can cover pretty quickly with adequate detail. Yeah, 100%. And <clears throat> that topic is understanding metabolism, right? And that might be a bit of a weird one for some people. You might go, oh, I know what metabolism is. You know, what does this, how does this apply to, you know, what I want to do with my health, fitness, nutrition, training, whatever it is, right? But the vast majority of people actually just kind of misunderstand metabolism and it makes getting results harder, right? Now, you don't have to go and get a fucking, I don't know, PhD in biochemistry or fucking something like that, right? But we do have to have some fundamental understanding of metabolism if we are to get our nutrition right, get our training right, and really have an understanding of things for a, a longer term perspective, if that makes sense. All right. Um, so do you want me to just get stuck in Gary, or do you have anything to say on why understanding metabolism is potentially important? No, tell me, tell me about what your basic definition of metabolism, tell me, tell me what it means. And then we can get into some of the details. Yeah. All right. So Metabolism, if you talk to anyone, they'll say, oh, like my metabolism is slow or I've got a fast metabolism. So colloquially, people use the word metabolism, right? But if you ask them what their metabolism is, that's where things kind of fall apart. They're kind of like, oh, well, I know the word. and I know it has some you know, re relationship with energy because people will say like, oh, I don't burn calories. So they, they know it's related to energy. But what does that actually mean, right? So metabolism, and we'll use a kind of more of a, biosciences definition of it it's simply the sum total of the chemical reactions in the body right so everything your body does all the different reactions you know your enzymes working you know digestion occurring your heart beating you know hormones being made etc right all of that requires energy right it doesn't it doesn't just happen for free it doesn't like just like you know anything you do in the real world it requires energy you have to you you want to watch the tv you have to plug it in you have to use electricity to watch TV, right? And it's the same with your body. You have to use energy to do all the things that you want to do to just stay alive. You know, just if you were to lay down and do quote unquote nothing, your body is still doing stuff and you still burn energy just surviving, right? So that's what we're talking about. Metabolism is just the sum total. So all of those different chemical reactions, the energetic demands of that, that is what metabolism is, right? Now, with metabolism, there are two processes, right? And one of them is catabolism or the breaking down, right? And the other one is anabolism, right? Which is building up, right? Um, and both of them require energy. Um, so that's, first of all, we need to get that into our head, right? Now, the reason I'm kind of just laboring the point here a little bit, because when we really break it down, when we really try to break down what metabolism is, what we're really talking about is the conversion of the energy we eat in food, right? Into the energy we need in our cells. So there is a bit of a flux here. So that's how we relate it back to nutrition. So our body requires energy. Where do we get energy from? Oh, we get it from the food that we eat. Now, that's two processes in there. That's the catabolism and also the anabolism, right? So when we're breaking down food, technically that is catabolism, right? It also, when we digest that food, assimilate that food, it's not like that is always in the quote unquote perfect form that we want. You know, we might build a different structure or convert that, I don't know, amino acid or, you know, carbohydrate, fatty acid, whatever. We might convert that into some other form, store it for a while, maybe make it part of a different structure, but then we might break that down in future and still reuse that fundamental unit, right? Now, that goes away from energy to an extent because it also signifies that we can use the food that we eat as building blocks, 
right? So if you eat some protein, for example, your body, you digest it, you break it down into, again, this is kind of a catabolic process. You break it down into its constituent amino acids. And then those amino acids can be used elsewhere in the body to build other protein structures. And in this kind of health and fitness world, a classic example would obviously be muscle, right? So that's why protein in the diet is important. It's a building block, right? Um, but that is the case as well for lipids or fats, if you will. So, you know, your cells, they all have a cell membrane and that's fatty acids, right? So we use building blocks, but also all of those things in general um, can also be burned for energy. So if you are in a deficit of energy, let's say you're in a starvation setting here, Gary, right? Your body will go, oh, you've eaten some protein, nothing else, right? It's just protein. But energy is your biggest requirement. It's not the building blocks. It's not the like, oh, I need to build up my muscles now, right? So your body will say, okay, well, I'm going to use this protein for energy, right? So there is a continuum here where some of the food that you eat is being used as an energy substrate. Some of the food that you eat is being used as uh, building blocks. But there is also a third element here in terms of the food that we eat, which does fall under uh, metabolism. Um, well, I suppose there is a fourth if we want to be just you know, a little bit pedantic. I'll go through both of them. So first of all, when you eat food, they also do serve, like the different molecules in that do also serve as like signaling molecules. And again, in a classic example in uh, the health and fitness world would be protein. When you eat protein, there's an amino acid in that called leucine. And leucine is a signaling molecule to well, via mTOR to build muscle right? So the food that we eat is also a signaling molecule or can also be signaling molecules. And that's a variety of things. For example, saturated fat, you know, uh, reduces, I always get that one wrong, reduces LDL receptor uh, expression. So that's a, a signaling molecule, even though we don't classically think of it like that. Now, a lot of that also does require energy because they are chemical reactions that are occurring, right? And we don't necessarily think of that all the time, but it is part of it. So, you know, I'm just being a little bit pedantic here, but that's part of it. But the other main one that's often talked about is the breakdown and elimination of various molecules. Now, this does go into a little bit of the energy flux thing that I was talking about earlier on. Like if you have stored glycogen, for example, you then break that down so that you can use that glycogen for energy. However, Oftentimes, well, first of all, that does require energy to do that, but you get more energy back out. So it's a positive. Um, however, oftentimes the breakdown of a lot of these different products, especially something like breaking down protein, does create what we'll call molecular waste, right? So if you're breaking down, converting different amino acids, you generally or it generally leads to a buildup of ammonia, right? We don't really want that. You know, it's kind of toxic to the body. So you need to excrete that. And the holding, the storing, the getting rid of, the elimination, all that, that requires energy as well, right? So that's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about metabolism. It's all those different things. Do you mind to say on that, Gary? Yeah, I think just one thing to note on that is the fact that I think sometimes when people get stuck into this topic, they get they get stuck and they don't end up with the conclusion. So when I think of like studying these topics, I like to think of it as you first you first go into this expansion phase where you go into trying to understand all these components of metabolism, but then you have to contract it all down again and say, okay, what does that actually mean? Because you see this a lot in health and fitness where people who have a small bit of knowledge of metabolism or biochemistry or whatever make false conclusions because they'll see things like, oh, everyone's saying that it's just, it's calories in, calories out, and it's about energy balance. But I've just studied metabolism and there's a whole lot more going on that we need to consider. And that's true. You have to understand the role of hormones. You have to understand the role of enzymes and these metabolic pathways. But what they don't realize is that that's actually baked into the conclusion when we talk about energy balance and calories in, calories out. So part of, of getting educated on this topic is being able to dig deep into that and then come out of it and say, okay, so what does that actually mean for nutrition or exercise, et cetera? Because as you say, there are all these processes that are ongoing, but they're often baked into the things that we say. So when we say someone has a fast metabolism, so to speak, we might be talking about the way that the rate of their enzymatic reactions modify in response to the food that they eat. Like, 
that's not an easily transmittable message, but it's 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 something that as you go deeper into the topic, you observe, but then you zoom out and, and use these kind of summary phrases when communicating it with your clients. So that's just something to be aware of as you dig into this topic. Yeah, and this is really brings us to the next point, which is when we're looking at this stuff, if you're a biochemist or even a cell biologist or maybe even a doctor, I don't know, um, you're not necessarily, well, all of those professions are potentially looking at it from a molecular basis. And you can get really down in the weeds of, oh, well, look at this, you know, uh, metabolic pathway of this uh, minute nutrient or this even metabolite or whatever, right? So you can get very, very down in the weeds. And that's definitely important in different fields. And it's definitely important to understand, like you said. But when we try to apply that information, we have to look at the commonalities and where all this stuff converges is energy, right? It all converges on that point of, okay, well, this requires energy. Okay. Oh, this requires energy. Oh, this, this, this gives energy. You know, it's like, Okay, cool. So they're all converging on this energy. What the fuck does that mean for our everyday life or, or you know, our practices, right? This is where calories come in, right? So calories are what we call that energy, right? Now, calories are just a reference to the energy that we're using, right? Calories don't exist. They're just a measurement, you know, like kilograms don't exist. It's just a measurement, but you can have a kilogram, you know? Um, so this is where calories come in. Now, when we're talking about that, if we refer back to the start of this conversation, when we said it's just a sum, metabolism is just a sum total of all these chemical reactions in the body, right? How do we apply that information or where does that come into, again, our daily practices? This is where that calories in, calories out discussion comes about, right? So your metabolism, when we talk about our metabolism in the more colloquial sense of the word, you know, we're talking about the calories out aspect of that, right? We're talking about the calories we calories we burn at rest. We're talking about the calories we burn exercising because you know more chemical reactions are happening to allow us to exercise. Our muscles are moving, etc. You know, so we're really concerned about the the calories out. So when someone talks about their metabolism, and you go, okay, well, how does this relate back to what I know about nutrition? What I know about calories? Someone says something about metabolism. Oh, they're talking about the calories outside of things. However, it is also influenced by the calories inside of things, okay? First of all, again, <clears throat> you have to break down the food that requires energy. You have to assimilate it. You have to do all the different things to get it where it needs to go in the body. So that requires energy. And when we talk about metabolism, we'll, we'll talk about these terms a little bit more in depth in a second. You'll often see another term thrown around, which is the thermic effect of food or the thermic effect of feeding, depending on what context it's used in. And this is the calorie burn from digesting, eating, et cetera, food, right? And certain macronutrients, certain nutrients have more of a calorie burn, i.e. they require more energy to break down, assimilate, use, et cetera, than other macronutrients. And a classic example is protein, right? So you eat some protein, you might notice that your body temperature goes up a little bit, right? That's the thermic effect of food, right? Or the thermic effect of feeding. Now it does happen with all food, right? You, you know, you eat any food, you're going to get some calorie burn. You have to digest the food. You have to make the enzymes to do that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that is something to understand that metabolism, when we're talking about it in the general sense of the word, we're generally talking about the calories out. However, we can't forget about calories in, right? And now the reason this whole calories in, calories out discussion is important is because that's the foundation of all diets, Okay. So again, when we're saying, oh, metabolism, like you can get down in the weeds of understanding all these complex metabolic pathways. Like I have literally about 10 books over there that just go through metabolic pathways of different nutrients. And like off the top of my head, I could you know, almost go through, I know you're much better at this, Gary, in terms of remembering the exact intermediates and everything, but you got almost go through a load of different, you know, classic metabolic pathways, right? But they all converge on energy. And again, energy in this context, we're just going to use calories. We could use joules. We could use other forms or other terms for it. But calories is the one we use, right? So it all converges on that. But the diet, all diets, they also converge. They also converge on calories. So whatever diet you see someone, oh, I go keto, I go carnivore, I go vegan, I go X, Y, Z, right? And if we're talking about body composition or health, even to an extent and performance, they all converge on calories. That's how they work, right? They're all working. They're all, you know, if you, if it changes your body composition, if it changes your, you know, body weight, 
it all converges on calories. So understanding this is actually really important, right? And now we have a little bit of a further layer to understand that and go, okay, so when we talk about our metabolism, that's the calories outside of things. It is influenced by the calories inside of things, but we can use that information, right? Now, let's actually kind of dig a little bit deeper into this, hopefully explain that a little bit more, right? So metabolism is influenced by the amount of food that we eat, right? Think about it. I said, there's a thermic effect of feeding. We're also talking about the sum total of all the chemical reactions. You eat more food, Gary, you're going to have to expend more energy to break down that food, right? You're going to have to expend more energy to assimilate, get all that nutrients, et cetera, right? So if you eat more food, you technically have a higher metabolism then because thermic effect of feeding. And we'll talk about those different things now in a second. We'll get back to them, right? But also all those building blocks, right? That's why we're eating food. So it's not just the energy. And this is important to just keep in mind. We're also using those building blocks, proteins, amino acids, lipids, carbohydrates. We're, we're using all those different things as building blocks for the different cells in our body, the different proteins in our body, et cetera, right? And then also we have to account for the energy required to excrete whatever waste products as well, okay? So that's metabolism. Now, we've, we've got that, right? Metabolism is also keeping that understanding now, it's the sum total of all the chemical reactions. Metabolism, metabolism is also influenced by the number of cells that we have right? Now, Gary, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many cells I have. I haven't counted them, right? Um, but we can use a proxy measure for the number of cells that we have. And that proxy measure that we use is our body weight. Okay. So again, the more astute among you, you're starting to relate all this stuff together and going, okay, so calories in, calories out, that influences your body weight. But also you're telling me that my body weight influences my metabolism, which is what also influences my calories in, calories out. So you can see there's a bi-directional pathway here, right? However, some cells, we can't just use body weight, some cells are more metabolically active. They do more chemical reactions than others, right? So a muscle cell, for example, it just does more, right? Even at rest, it just does more than something like a fat cell, right? So you're burning more energy, you're doing more chemical reactions just to keep that protein in that cell, in that muscle cell versus the relatively inert fat cell. Now, fat cells still do require energy and maintenance, et cetera. They're not completely energetically, you know, mute, but that gives us something important to go. Okay. So if you are someone that has more body fat versus someone who has less, if you weigh the same, so we go, oh, it's the number of cells that doesn't necessarily tell us all we need to know about your metabolism, right? So if you have lots of fat, let's say you, me and you, Gary, let's say we're both hundred kilos, right? But I'm 30% body fat and you're 6% body fat and hundred kilos. You'd be jacked out of your mind, right? You would have a higher metabolism because even though we weigh the same, so we'll say, oh, that's a rough proxy for the number of cells. You have more metabolically active cells than I have, right? Because I have 30% body fat, right? So again, this starts to build out that picture of metabolism. Remember, we're saying metabolism is this calories outside of things. Now we have a further refinement of that going, okay, well, first of all, we said, you know, it's influenced by the amount of food that you eat. If you're a heavier individual, you probably have to eat more food to sustain that mass. But also, if you're a heavier individual and you have more metabolically active tissue, i.e. lean mass, and we'll just use muscle mass as a proxy for that, even though it does, you know, also take into account bone, uh, organs, etc. We'll just use muscle mass. If you have more muscle mass, technically you have a faster metabolism in the colloquial sense of the word uh, faster metabolism because you burn more calories even at rest. And that's that calories outside of things, right? So again, we're starting to build out a picture. Does that make sense, Gary? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Now, these cells can be called upon to do more metabolic processing, right? Which requires more energy. So if we're at rest, so, so far we've kind of been assuming you're just at rest, right? If you start doing stuff like exercising, your cells are being required to do more chemical reactions. And as a result, they burn more energy, right? Or they use more energy, right? And again, this is one of those things, which is a little bit counterintuitive, which we'll talk about now in a second is if you weigh more, you know, you have more cells. And then you also move more. So let's say we both, again, 
I'm 100 kilos, Gary, you're whatever, 55 kilos an hour or something, I don't know. Um, the two of us, we go, oh, we're going to go for a little walk, you know, and we do a, a kilometer walk. I burned more calories than you doing that one kilometer of walk because I have to carry 100 kilos, whereas you only have to carry whatever you weigh, 55 kilos, right? So that is important to understand because it kind of goes against what people think in terms of someone who is heavier, someone who's maybe overweight, obese, and um, they go, oh, I have a slow metabolism. But as soon as you exercise, that definitely completely flips. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in depth in a second, but it definitely flips because if you weigh 400 pounds, you know, like you burn a lot of energy just doing normal everyday tasks. And if you don't really conceptualize, or you can't really conceptualize that, like an example I always use is, look, just go wet, put on a weighted vest, you know, put on like a 20 kilo, 30 kilo, 50 kilo weighted vest, and then go around and do your everyday tasks, right? You're going to be sweating just walking up the stairs, right? So you can imagine then, okay, so if I weighed 50 kilos extra of body fat, which is already, you know, metabolically, we'll call it less active, you're burning more calories just doing the same things, okay? Again, we'll just put that away store that away for a second, but it's just important to understand, right? Now, it is also important to understand that this system is not perfect, okay? It's not like, oh, I eat one calorie, boom, I have one calorie of energy, right? It doesn't really work like that, right? And it definitely doesn't work like that if you really start following things through to their logical conclusion, right? So some heat is lost in these various processes, right? And that's the same with any energy conversion that well not any most I, i'm going to go out on a limb here and say most if not all reactions right there's very few that are like 100 no heat loss to the environment right and that's we could say that's just a concept of entropy or a further refinement of entropy heat loss to the universe cool right our body is no different so when we do all these chemical reactions you lose some heat right and when we talked about that thermic effect of feeding feeding even you i, I use the example of you eat some protein or you eat food, you start feeling a bit warmer. You start feeling a bit, okay, my body temperature has gone up, right? And now you can view that as a, 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 you know, a poor part of the system, but it's actually not. The fact that we can do that allows humans, at least well, most animals that can do it, to live in more environments, right? So it's actually beneficial to an extent so that I can live in a northern climate where it's cold. I can keep my body temperature at a more optimal level. And I can also influence that by virtue of how much food I eat, right? So this is also why you see people die of like a exposure, like hypothermia and different things like that it, when they are under starvation settings. It's not necessarily just because their body is weakened because of starvation. It's also because they're not able to get their body temperature up. They're not able to regulate their body temperature as much because they're not eating the food that is required to help with that, you know, body temperature regulation, right? So even though heat is lost to the environment, it is actually beneficial for keeping us at a certain optimal temperature. Now, this does vary between humans. For example, if you are, I don't know, a sub-Saharan African, for example, and that's where your people have come from for fucking millennia, right? Like your heat loss to the environment is going to be different than someone who is, you know, Northern European, their ancestors have been in Northern Europe in the icy tundra or whatever for hundreds, thousands of years, right? There are differences in the amount of heat loss to the environment and the amount of, you know, energy that is effectively lost, right? So we don't need to go down that rabbit hole, but it is interesting, right? Now, Gary, is that all making sense to you? Yeah, I think so. And I just wanted to add just a, a couple of brief notes to maybe add a, a bit of a bit of context and caveats to some of the metabolic points. So I think one thing that's helpful to actually strengthen your understanding of metabolism is to consider some of the like outlier cases. So for example, in cases of disease, in cases of pregnancy, when you're a baby, how is all this stuff different? How does it play in with calories in, calories out? And one example that's quite interesting is that of when you're when you're a baby, when you're a newborn, let's say, let's say you're seven kilos in weight. Okay, you're a couple of months in, you've you've grown to seven kilos. Fair play to you. That was probably you at birth, Petty. But uh, actually, I was a fucking big baby. <laughs> so if you're if you're in your first 10 kilos of life, your metabolism is actually about a hundred calories per kilo in that first 10 kilos. And that's 
a lot. If you think of yourself as being 100 kilos now, Paddy, imagine you need 100 calories. That would be 10,000 calories a day. So there's a very different metabolic requirement when you're in that state of um, infancy versus when you're an adult. And you then ask yourself, well, why? What, what's the difference? And then you, all you have to do is look at the the growth of a baby. Look at how um, aggressively a baby is growing in terms of the percentage of their body weight they're increasing. If we were increasing at the same percentage, it would be all body fat. But they have these demands to grow their organs, to grow their bones, to grow their muscles. And of course, there are other things like heat loss to the environment, generating their own heat, all this sorts of stuff. So it's it's interesting to to see how... Go back to that. That's that anabolic or anabolism exactly. that we talked about earlier on. Exactly. And and that's what that's where you are when you're a when you're a baby. You're in this primed, extremely anabolic state, very similar to the pubertal state, where you're just growing faster than your muscles can even keep up. So these metabolic requirements are literally programmed into our physiology. And that's why we see these differences in caloric requirements throughout the lifespan. So obviously when you're an adult, it's a bit more stable then. But there can still be differences in terms of our caloric requirements, depending on our health state, for example. So if you're, let's say, let's say you're someone with a lung disease of sorts. OK, let's say I have a lung a better, disease. better example. Let's say you get severe burns. across. Yep, perfect perfect example. That, that's a better. You can go through that one. <laughs> yeah, so bur burns is a good example, um, because when you get burnt um, all over your body, your metabolic rate is sky high. OK, it rapidly um, increases when you get burns all over your body. And this is obviously a, a, an artifact of having to heal all of that tissue is one one part of that. And also you lose you lose a lot of heat. You lose a lot of heat. Yeah, see, it's basically yeah. the, it's the perfect combination of catabolism because you have to break down a lot of proteins. You have to break down a lot of cells, which requires energy. Right. And then you also have to rebuild a lot of the body. So you're, and as you said, the heat loss, the environment and all that, that does change. You know, we don't need to necessarily go too deep into that, but it is a perfect example of, okay, well, it's not just building the body that requires energy. Breaking down the body also requires energy. And then if you have to break down the body and then also rebuild, that's a hell of a lot of energy. And this is why you see burn victims, like they'll often put them on like a, Anavar, for example, right? They'll put them on anabolic drugs <laughs> um, so they can stave off some of this catabolism. Now, they do need some of it, but we're just really not necessarily, even though we're saying stave off some of the catabolism, what we're really trying to do is get a leg up on anabolism. Yes, and all that trauma as well from burns mm -hmm. can literally just break down your muscles and cause all sorts of complications. So you have so many things going on there. And um, the lung disease example is also helpful because just putting it very simply, normally when we're running these um, metabolic processes to generate energy, most of the time we're going to be using uh, aerobic uh, energy metabolism. And that is slower, but more efficient. Like anything in life, when you're using uh, your aerobic system, you're basically taking your time to break down the food diligently, put everything in its right place, and you get far more ATP, the energy currency, um, per unit of food or energy substrate than if you were to do it anaerobically. When you do it anaerobically, or maybe just fast energy metabolism is a better way to think of it. When you do that, you get less ATP, but you're able to generate energy a lot quicker. And that's what happens during exercise, during very high intensity exercise, we'll burn more calories, um, per minute, we're wasting more energy um, and we have higher energy requirements. So there's there's actually greater um, energy wasting when you're breaking down calories from, or breaking down food, I should say, for calories technically. Um, but that also happens in, in lung disease and various disease states. So if I'm unable to get enough oxygen in through my lungs, my resting lactate, if you were to measure it in my blood, is going to be higher. And that's somewhat a reflection of the amount of anaerobic energy metabolism that's going on. So by virtue of having lower aerobic fitness, I'm actually wasting more energy to produce the energy that I require. So that's something that's interesting to, to consider because it may seem counterintuitive. You might think, oh, if I have far better aerobic fitness, I'm going to burn way more energy. And in practice, that kind of is how it works sometimes because if you're running through these anaerobic processes all the time, like even someone that's very obese can be doing this, 
Of course, you're going to be more fatigued. You're not going to be as likely to be moving around, etc. But it just goes to show that there's all these variables underlying. And then pregnancy is obviously another example where this, where a lot of these things come together because you have an increase in energy requirement by virtue of the fact that you are growing another human or humans potentially. But then you've also got the personal factor that you actually have an increase in body weight, an increase in body mass, and thus you have an increase in metabolism as a result of that as well. So again, many of these variables are coming together and it all illustrates that there's a, a more complex relationship between energy in and energy out than maybe a lot of people appreciate, but it really does come down to that at the end of the day. Yeah, and also the obesity, obesity one is, or I should say the anaerobic aerobic one is really important to kind of understand not you don't need to go into the nuances of it but it does illustrate the point that if you look at this stuff in a, like a segment you're just like oh well look here this person who is unfit or maybe they have lung disease or whatever and they're really redlining the anaerobic system you're like oh well that's actually really good for calorie burn because it's inefficient it's not giving us as much you know atp which is we'll just say it's calories uh as you know, the aerobic system. So you might go, oh, well, that's that's beneficial. So I'm going to use that information. And to an extent, you can use that information, but we have to actually look at the real world there. Like if you're constantly tired because you're using an inefficient system, you're not going to be doing those things, like you said, like walking around, you're going to be more fatigued. You're more likely to sit down. You're going to walk up a flight of stairs and go, oh, I have to stop here. So you might go, oh, well, it's less efficient. So it burns more calories. I'm going to you know really try to prioritize that. But in reality, if you use the aerobic system, you have way more endurance. You can go for longer. You don't get tired. You know, like this is one of those things as well where people say, oh, I'm just so tired all the time. And then people tell them, oh, well, you need to do some like fitness work. And it's a kind of counterintuitive thing where it's like, well, if I expend more energy, how the fuck am I going to <laughs> feel more energetic? But that's what happens, you know? you become a more aerobically fit. So you're more efficient with your energy burn. You also create more mitochondria. So you're actually able to process more energy, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. We've talked about cardio adaptations before. We won't belabor the point, um, but it is really interesting to understand, right? Now, all of this information we've been talking about, although I've been trying to constantly relate it back to the real world and you know, the diet and all that kind of stuff, it's still a little bit abstract, right? And it doesn't really tell you about metabolism as the colloquial term is used, right? But we can, we can refine this. We can, you know, really start to understand this a little bit more, right? And metabolism can effectively, for this discussion anyway, especially related to nutrition, metabolism can be broken down into further subsections, right? So this is depends, or this, this categorization is where that energy is being burned, you know? That's what we'll say, right? So there's a few components. The first one is what's often called the basal metabolic rate or BMR, right? And this is basically your metabolism at rest, right? So your calorie expenditure, remember I said earlier on, relating it back to calories in, calories out. This is your calories out at rest. So you're literally asleep. You're just lying down, whatever. This is your, this is your calorie burn right? Now, there are some differences. There's some, you know, depending on what state you're in, if you're sleeping versus if you're just resting, et cetera, there are differences, but we can say just on average, this is just a baseline, right? Before you do any activity. Now, some people often misconstrue this and then say, oh, well, that turns off then when you're uh, walking around or doing anything. And that's not the case. It's the, the background. It's the, it's the energy requirements just required to keep you alive. Okay. Keep your heart beating keep your brain working, keep everything just there, just to maintain, right? This is your, your BMR, right? So that's somewhat fixed. However, if we relate it back to earlier points, there are ways that this is influenced, right? First of all, body weight is a big one, right? Um, and we'll, we'll actually, we'll get back to those things in a second. I'll go through the categories first because it, it makes it easier to understand, right? Now, the other thing that we also have in these this categorization system is non-exercise activity thermogenesis, right? NEAT. And this is basically the calories you burn in activities that aren't exercise, right? So if you're watching this, if you're on YouTube or whatever, you see I'm moving my hands around, I'm talking, I'm very like moving my head around, et cetera, right? That all burns calories, right? But it's not formalized exercise, you know? I know you're the same as myself, Gary, like you're a fidgeter, right? So you're fidgeting around, you know, hitting your toes, moving your hands, doing whatever, like, that all burns energy, okay? 
And to an extent, we can use a proxy measure for this rather than going, oh, well, how many exact calories did I burn fidgeting or moving my hands? You can use steps. So your daily step count is a good proxy for this. Um, although obviously it doesn't encompass absolutely everything. Like I'm moving my hands around, my step count is not going up, right? Um, but anyway, so that's that's another area that can, you know, it, it is calorie expenditure. It's calories out, if you will. Um, the next one that we have then is exercise activity, activity thermogenesis, right? Eat. And this is basically the calories you burn doing exercise. Now it doesn't have to be, you know, cardiovascular exercise. It's just the calories you burn doing formalized exercise. So you do resistance training, you burn some calories. You do some sprinting, you burn some calories. You do some running, uh, long distance, you burn some calories, right? That's the eat. Now, obviously, if you train three days a week versus seven days a week, there's going to be a difference there over the week, right? Um, and then the other one, the final component, the final category even, is the thermic effect of food or the thermic effect of feeding, which we mentioned earlier on. This is TEF or TEF, some people say. Um, and this is basically the calories expended in the breakdown and assimilation, the digestion, whatever you want to call it, of food, right? So they're the broad categories. Now, all of them, when we tot them all up, add them together, this goes into what's called, or the, what we often call, your total daily energy expenditure, right? Your TDEE, -E, right? So you'll see calculators online. It's like, oh, work out your TDEE, -E, right? And this is what they're talking about. Now, let's relate this back. Let's take a step back here. All we're talking about is metabolism. So all the stuff that we've talked about previous, this is all just a further way to categorize that. And the reason we're categorizing this is because we do have some influence over these various components. Some of them more so than others, some of them less so than others, right? Um, but ultimately, when we tot all these up, we total them all, that's our calorie burn for the day. Now, again, we go back to understanding, oh, like, why does this matter? Well, actually, we'll, we'll come back to that, right? Gary, do you have anything to say on just the categorization element right now? Um, not much, no. I think, I think the important thing is that it's intended to be practical. And of course, you can you can go into further depth in terms of questioning how neat, for example, relates to step count versus um, other, you know, fidgeting, shivering, these types of things, you know, but it, it's, it's really not too important. The most important part of this is just understanding those broad categories and then understanding what it is that you can actually influence because your exercise and your non-exercise activity thermogenesis or baseline physical activity you could say are the two things that are going to move the, the needle the most because the thermic effect of feeding is really just a response to what you're eating and if you're following generally healthy eating guidelines eating enough protein etc like it's not something that we're going to massively boost so um like that it, it, it just it, it's quite simple really in practice you can overcomplicate it if you'd like to i just don't think it's helpful yeah, hundred percent. And before we get into like really like what you have control over, because again, like you said, that's the practical stuff. That's like okay, so someone says they have a fast or slow metabolism. Like, what do we have control over? We'll come to that in a second. But the reason this is important, and again, this goes back to this calories in, calories out, right? All diets converge on this. All metabolism converges on this, right? And the way we use that, in at least in the health and fitness world, the way we use that information is to understand that. If you eat more, then you expend, right? So your calories out, we've been discussing calories out. But if you eat more calories in, right? So your food contains, I say, Gary, I taught everything up for you. I'm like, oh, there's your BMR, there's your NEAT, there's your EAT, there's your TEF. Got that all, comes to 2,500 calories for you, Gary, right? And then you eat 3,000 calories, right? You now have a surplus of energy going into the body. Now, that does, like we've talked about, influence your thermic effect of feeding. So now that you're eating that, okay, maybe the thermic effect of feeding goes up a little bit because you're eating more food, right? It's like 250, 2550, right? It's not a huge amount, but it does go up, you know, because you're eating more food, right? So we're still in a surplus. That's going to lead to body weight gain over time. That's the, that's the crux of the understanding here, this calories in, calories out. Conversely, if you eat the exact same amount of calories out, so this TDEE, -E, you got that number, and you eat the exact same amount of calories as that, your weight 
it's going to stay relatively the same. You know, it's going to fluctuate because of different things, you know, menstrual cycle, water weight, et cetera, et cetera. But it's going to be broadly the same, right? Now, this is where a lot of people really care about. It's if you eat less than your total daily energy expenditure, your TDEE, you're going to lose weight, right? That's how fat loss occurs. So you look at all these diets. Oh, this is this is the diet for fat loss. How is it working? Oh, well, Patrick said that they all converge on calories in, calories out. What does that mean for me? Oh, well, my calories out, my expenditure is X. And this diet is getting me to eat Y, which is, you know, 500 calories less than X. You're going to lose weight, right? But if you were to do that exact same diet, but eat the same amount of calories as X, whatever, 2,500 that you burn, your TDEE, you're not going to get weight loss. It's not going to happen. <laughs> right and again that's important to understand right but this brings us back to this point of fast and slow metabolisms because this is something you will hear people say they just say oh well i can't lose weight because i have a slow metabolism or i can't gain weight because i have a fast metabolism but the reality of the situation again to the keen listener you'll start to realize oh, fuck actually the colloquial terms here are actually the exact opposite of what is experienced in like reality. So if you have a fast metabolism, what we're going to expect from someone that has a fast metabolism, based on everything that we've learned about, we're going to expect someone with a fast metabolism to weigh a lot, right? Because a component of that is this, you know, basal metabolic rate. So if you're a bigger individual, you have a higher basal metabolic rate. You do more neat, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And again, go back to that example. Gary, throw on a weighted vest there, 20 kilos, and do your daily tasks. You're going to burn more energy, right? Exercise as well. Put on your 20 kilo weight vest and do your exercise. You burn more calories, right? And in the thermic effect of feeding, oh, if you're obese or something, you would presume that even just to maintain that weight, you're eating more food, right? So you have a higher thermic effect of feeding. So in reality, you actually have a, like a bigger metabolism because you weigh more and all that I've just discussed. And that's what people are thinking like, oh, that's a fast metabolism because you burn through energy, right? But we call that a slow metabolism, right? <laughs> In colloquial speak. So it's the exact opposite. And conversely, the, the same is true to the other side. If you have someone that has a quote unquote fast metabolism, the colloquial term, you would expect them to be heavier. But when people use that term, they're like, oh, well, I just can't, you know, can't gain weight. And when you go through their, their, their day, you're like, okay, well, your basal metabolic rate is a little bit lower because you just weigh less. You know, you don't have a huge amount of mass. You're like, whatever, 50 kilos, right? Your non-activity thermogenesis, well, probably high, and we'll, we'll come to that now in a second, well, probably high in your daily activity. Like it could be way higher if you just weigh 20 kilos more <laughs> than the exact same daily tasks, right? And then your exercise, again, that might be high. That might be why you have a fast metabolism. You're just burning through a lot of calories via exercise. But your thermic effect of food, probably lower because you're just not eating as much as someone who is, you know, 50 kilos heavier than you in general, right? Now, obviously, you might be because you're burning through a lot of exercise through meat and eat, but we'll just use this as an example baseline, right? So I just wanted to say that because those two terms that people throw around are actually the exact opposite of what is the reality of the situation. Now, before we get on to what we can actually control, Gary, do you have anything to say there? Uh, the only thing I'd say there is that like the the one thing the one thing that does does vary here that's that is important is that dynamically there can be differences and what i mean by that is that whether or not you for example if i undereat for a while and you undereat for a while there might be a difference in how we adapt to that deficit and the same thing goes in the opposite direction in response to overfeeding if you look into the research you'll see the terms the thrifty and spend thrift um, phenotypes that can can be identified in terms of the level of adaptation to a deficit or to a surplus, and this is this can be studied and or observed through a couple of different changes. For example, um, how much if we if we measure our levels of energy expenditure when we're fasting and then we compare it to when we're eating, there's actually different levels of energy expenditure responses in those two conditions. So people do see this in like body temperature, you know? Yeah, exactly. So people do differ in terms of their actual response to a meal consumed and then over their overall um, 
energy intake. And that's something that we notice a lot with clients because some people, as soon as you put them into a deficit, they immediately adapt to a certain portion of that deficit and we might need to reduce calories more consistently. Whereas other individuals seem to be able to just drop their calories and then maintain that deficit throughout. Their energy expenditure isn't modified too much. And you'll notice this yourself in terms of things like sweating, for example. Like when I'm in a surplus, I sweat nuts, ridiculously. I just sweat so much. I'm way more fidgety, way more active than I would be if I was in deficit. And it seems like for me, adapting in that positive direction occurs far more significantly. And that's something that's kind of helpful for preventing obesity, of course. But that's just something that it's something you can't change. So it's just something that you have to be aware of and something that explains some of the reasons that people might observe their diet not working. You know, you drop your calories by 200 and three or four weeks in your weight isn't changing. And you're like, oh, calorie deficits don't work when in fact you've just adapted to that deficit. Yeah, that's important to understand. We will talk a bit more about the adaptive nature. And then also there's another thing that we need to kind of talk about that is related to this, which is this kind of constrained energy model. So we'll get to those in a second. But what do we actually have control over? Because this is the stuff. This is the this is the meat and potatoes, right? You understand this, and then you kind of just even have been half listening to the stuff before. If you understand this, you're in a good spot, right? So what do we control? Well, the first thing that we can control is our body mass, right? And ideally, we can also control our lean body mass, right? So if you have more lean body mass or you're heavier, you're going to expend more calories, right? We have control over that. It's a modifiable thing. It's not like, oh, Gary, you're just destined to be 70 kilos, you know? No, like if you eat more, you can be heavier, right? If you eat less, you can be lighter, right? Now, again, there's difficulties around actually executing on that and that's why we do stuff like coaching but it's still a modifiable thing right so body mass that's that's modifiable that's going to impact on all of the things that your bmr your exercise activity thermogenesis your non-exercise activity thermogenesis and to an extent your thermic effect of feeding right now the other thing that we have uh you know we have control over is our neat right our non-exercise activity thermogenesis now obviously some people have more control over this than others and again, like you were saying, Gary, it does also depend on where you are in your overall diet in terms of if you've been dieting down, you've been in a calorie deficit for a long period of time, you know, you might have just a down regulation in your meat, your fidgeting, you're moving your hands around, et cetera, right? But we do still have control over this to some extent. And what we often use is just a proxy count, which is just your daily step count, right? Keep that consistent. And you've actually controlled for a lot of non-exercise activity thermogenesis not all of it by any means right but we have control for a lot of it right and then we also have your eat your exercise activity thermogenesis so you have control of your exercise patterns like you could literally just go into the gym and go all right i'm just going to burn 500 calories you know and do that consistently every single day <laughs> right now obviously probably going to be tired some days etc life doesn't you know exactly work to plan but you have control over that to some extent right? And then we do also have control over the thermic effect of feeding. And we wouldn't generally use this too much. But if you were like, look, I really, I need to be in an extra 200 calorie deficit and or yeah, 100 calorie deficit, we'll just say make it a little bit easier. And you're like, I, I really don't want to necessarily eat less. You could still manipulate your calorie intake or your calorie expenditure, I suppose, by eating more protein, for example, like if you had three grams per kilogram of protein, per day, right? Like you would be burning more calories. Your thermic effect of feeding would be higher, right? So we could use that, but in practice, we generally don't outside of just getting your protein intake to a good level, right? Now, what do we not have control over? And I say this because this is the thing that people really focus on. They're like, oh, this is the reason, right? We don't have control over to it to a huge extent. And that is our hormones, right? Namely, we don't have control over our thyroid hormone, which is the one that people classically bring up, even though it's actually wrong in the whole thinking, right? Because thyroid hormone is actually influenced by energy intake, right? It's one of those hormones that you could classify it as a catabolic hormone, but it's not really like it does a lot of things that are anabolic in nature. And effectively, your thyroid is signaling that energy intake is coming in or energy is coming in, that you have energy available, right? So you often or you almost always see higher thyroid output with more food, right? Not less, right? So if you have someone who's obese and they're eating 5,000 calories per day, 
their thyroid output is probably higher than the other person that's lean and you know trains five times a week or whatever right like if you go into a calorie deficit right you're going to see your your thyroid hormone output reduced right you see this all the time in bodybuilding for example they get down to you know six percent body fat and they do a blood test and they're like fuck you're you literally have a hypothyroidism here right and they're cold all the time they have all the classic sim- symptoms of someone who has hypothyroidism right so again this is one of those things where it's the opposite of what people generally say in the real world and obviously again then you get it measured like if someone who's obese they say oh it's a thyroid problem they get it measured and you're like well you actually have if anything, you've hyperthyroidism, <laughs> right? Like you have excess th- thyroid output above the reference range because you're a bigger individual, right? Um, but also there's other hormones involved, anabolic hormones like testosterone. We don't have control over it. We do have control over it to some extent <clears throat> because the like if we're trying to build more lean mass, right? That's That's why testosterone generally builds more lean mass so if you're just naturally an outlier and you just have naturally a high testosterone output you're probably going to have more lean mass right however we can't really directly influence testosterone levels like obviously you can supplement with a we'll call it supplementing be uh, nice you can supplement with a testosterone um but outside of that you can't really influence your testosterone besides eating enough right because again food intake does influence hormones namely testosterone testosterone is an anabolic hormone and as we said if you're eating more food part of metabolism is anabolism is building up so if your body's like oh well, i have to build things up a signal to that is oh let's produce more testosterone to then build things up right and um, so you do have some control over it but it's not something that you can vastly control right so we don't have control over hormones outside of eating enough calories right basically just don't eat too little calories and your hormones will generally be in a good place right now a slight side note is that calories do impact on the various sex hormones and you do see this a lot of times in low calorie diets you see you know menstrual cycle irregularities we've talked about that a lot in the female series you know basically just don't diet on low calories you do see this as well in men in terms of you diet on low calories you eat very low calories your testosterone goes down you can't get a boner anymore etc right so Our diet does impact on all this stuff, um, but it's still not something that we would necessarily be really looking to influence as it relates to metabolism, at least, right? Unless you have anything to say on that, Gary, I'll just keep moving on. Not for it. Fantastic. So going back to that example of a fast versus slow metabolism, right? Someone with a fast metabolism is going to have more lean mass. They're going to move more, both in terms of their neat and their eat, right? However... That's not the full story, right? So someone with a fast metabolism, that's why they have a fast metabolism. They move more. That's the vast majority of it. Now, generally, they'll probably have more lean mass, but this is the this is the crux of the issue. They're moving more throughout the day, right? Now, there are also some other neurohormonal signaling around like satiety, for example, that we won't get too much into, but this does, it is an important part of the conversation because, you know, you could have way better satiety signals. So you just feel fuller for longer with the same unit of food versus someone who doesn't have that same, you know, neuro uh, hormonal situation as you. Um, So you might be able to stay eating 500 calories less versus someone who has a different signaling, right? So we won't get too into that, um, but it does influence your propensity to overeat or undereat, right? Um, so if you have a friend who is a skinny individual, Gary, let's use you, um, has a skinny individual who's like, oh, I can't gain weight, right? When you actually break things down, do they have a fast metabolism? Mm, not really. If I think they have a slower metabolism than someone who is heavier and you know, maybe even doesn't move as much, but the crux of the issue is you probably move more, right? Your niche, it goes up like, Gary, you're, you're struggling to gain weight. Oh, you can't do it. Why is that? Like you said earlier on, you just start fidgeting more. You start burning through a lot of this calorie surplus. Like Gary, I'm going to put you in a 500 calorie surplus. And then you burn away 400 calories of that extra (laughs) per day, just with fidgeting and walking around a bit more and, you know, whatever else. That's where the difference occurs with someone with a fast metabolism versus slow metabolism. With a slow metabolism, 
usually you'll see the person that have less lean mass, right? And this is important, especially if you're trying to equate for someone like, oh, Gary, we're both 100 kilos here, um, but I have 30% body fat and you have 6% body fat. How come we don't get the same results here? We're doing the same thing every single day. Like, I just have less lean mass. I'm just burning less calories, even at rest than you, even though we weigh the same. And this is, this is a problem or a mistake that a lot of people make. They go, oh, I'm following this person. Or I'm following this woman online and she's 70 kilos and I'm 70 kilos. How come she's able to eat 2,500 calories per day, but I'm struggling on 1,500 calories per day? And you're like, there's huge differences in that person. This person is like jacked out of their mind at 70 kilos and you're 40% body fat at 70 kilos. So like there's a huge difference here in terms of, what that 70 kilos actually looks like in terms of metabolically active tissue, right? Um, so if you have that friend who seems to eat very little, but gains weight, right? This is kind of what's happening. Generally, what will happen is if you compare the two individuals or compare two individuals, the person that's like, oh, I eat so little, but I, I, I seem to gain weight. They probably have more calorie uh, or sorry, less calorie expenditure day to day, because maybe they're just not as active that you're not accounting for your daily step count, for example, even if they go, oh, I go to the gym three times a week, just like this other person goes to the gym three times per week. What will often happen is this individual will also eat more at certain times. And this is generally you know driven by, first of all, potentially a poorer relationship with food, but also neurohormonal signaling, like maybe this person doesn't get as full for as long with a certain calorie level so they're more likely to overeat at other times that you know you're not seeing you're not out with your friends you know you're overeating you go home after eating the nice dinner with everyone else you seem to all eat the same amount of calories and then you go home and the overweight individual is eating more food whereas the person that has a faster metabolism just goes to bed they don't eat more you know it's like we don't see everything and when we actually track everything you know, we start seeing where the calories actually go. Now, there are some uh, exceptions here. We're not going to get into them, but for the vast majority of the case, that's what holds true, right? So going back to what you said earlier on, Gary, in terms of metabolism is adaptive too, right? So it is adaptive in terms of it isn't a fixed number. If I just work out your total daily energy expenditure, it doesn't stay the same. You know, if you've been dieting, you've been dieting down in a calorie deficit, you've been a thousand calories less than what your maintenance calories are. Like, your metabolism adapts to that. It's generally going to downregulate, first of all, your thermic effect of feeding because you're just eating less food, right? So we're two individuals. I'm eating 2,500. You're eating 1,500. You're eating less food. You're burning less calories to digest, assimilate, et cetera, all that food, right? Your NEAT has probably gone down. So your non-exercise activity thermogenesis has gone down because you know, you're know you just not moving around as much, right? And this is like you said, Gary, like you just stop moving around as much. You stop sweating. Like I remember when we dieted down like really lean, it was like 2017 or something like, like you would just not sweat anymore. Like we'd be fucking pushing ourselves and you just wouldn't sweat. I'm the exact opposite in terms of like my metabolism doesn't adapt. I would just fucking sweat like a pig regardless. <laughs> um, so I would die in a, a prison camp where we're a starvation setting. Whereas Gary would just be like, stop fidgeting. And he just slowly retreat, stop moving. Was I'd be like, oh, just keep fucking moving around dead within two weeks, you know? Um, so your neat, that goes down. And that's probably the biggest one in terms of if we're not controlling for anything and you just start eating less, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis will go down quite a lot, right? Now, you will also see a slight reduction in your basal metabolic rate because, you know, you might see some lean mass loss, right? So your muscle mass might go down a little bit, especially if you're not eating enough protein, right? So there will be a slight change there. Now, there is also a change um, if you eat less in terms of your exercise activity thermogenesis. And that's because, first of all, presumably you weigh less now, right? That's, that's going to affect everything, right? But then also you know, you probably aren't fueling really, really well for your training sessions. So you're probably not pushing as hard. Like even if it's a case of, oh, I'm doing some resistance training. And while we don't necessarily look at resistance training as a calorie burning session, like you might just not push as hard because you just don't have the energy. You don't have the energy to grind through an extra rep or whatever, right? So that all serves to reduce your calories out, your calorie expenditure, your metabolism right? However, if we eat more, again, it's adaptive both ways, right? If you eat more, your metabolism goes up, right? And again, that's a little bit counterintuitive to what people think, because if you're overweight and obese, you've probably been eating more and you've got a faster metabolism or a higher metabolism overall. And again, this is a case of your thermic effect of feeding, you're eating more calories, you have to digest, assimilate, et cetera, all that stuff. And then also your neat, you're probably going to move around more if you have more energy coming into the system. Like you said, Gary, you, for example, you notice it, you know, you eat more calories, 
start fidgeting more, you start burning off more, you start sweating more, you start doing all these extra things, which fall under this category of non-exercise activity, activity thermogenesis. Maybe sweating doesn't, that's kind of BM or we would maybe classify that as, but you know what I mean, you're fidgeting more, right? And then you also see a slight bump in your basal metabolic rate because you know, you've got more lean mass, you know, you're, you're, you're building more muscle potentially, right? And again, your exercise probably also changes in terms of you're able to push yourself harder during your sessions, right? Now, the important thing to understand about all of this is that this is normal. This is not you breaking your metabolism. If you diet down and you go, oh, like I, my, my maintenance theoretically should be 2000 calories, but I've been dieting for so long. You know, my maintenance is actually 1600 calories. I'm eating 1600 and my body weight stays the same, right? Like you didn't break your metabolism. You know, all you have to do is start eating a little bit more and it'll just go back up. Now, this is not a perfect system. You know, it's not like, oh, well, I'll just eat a little bit more and it go back up to 2000. First of all, that 2000 is probably a theoretical number. It doesn't account for the changing nature of your body. Like some things have downregulated and maybe you've lost some lean mass, etc. There's so many different things that go into making that number that, you know, maybe it is now 1900. It doesn't mean you've broken your metabolism. It just means that you've changed over time, which is completely normal. It's a completely normal part of metabolism, of the diet, et cetera, of life, right? Um, so when someone says they've broken their metabolism, it's not correct. Just eat a little bit more. All of this stuff, well, the vast majority of this stuff will uh, fix itself, <laughs> right? Gary, do you have anything to say on the adaptive nature of metabolism? No, that's spot on. Yeah, and a part of that, again, the adaptive nature you will see, which will bring us on to the next point, is when we get really low in calories, you'll see some of the stuff that makes up BM or kind of switches offline, right? And some of that stuff is like sex hormones or sexual function or reproductive, you know, we'll call it your reproductive system, right? Some of that energy that was being put towards that will just kind of go, okay, well, maybe during a starvation setting, which is, you know, a calorie deficit, that's controlled starvation, maybe that's not the most optimal time to have a child, right? So it makes sense. It's adaptive. It goes, okay, well, this is not the good time to reproduce, right? So some of that stuff goes offline. That's where you see like menstrual cycle irregularities, your guys can't get boners, et cetera, right? And this also brings us to the point that metabolism is somewhat constrained and it's not completely additive, right? Because often we talk about that point in terms of, oh, well, if you eat too few calories, you know, you're going to see reproductive hormone changes, reproductive system changes. But it can also happen the other way, right? You can't just keep exercising and doing more niche, doing more exercise and continue to see calorie expenditure go up, right? Because your body's also going to go, oh, well, fuck it. Maybe it's not the right time to reproduce here as well, right? And the, the top ceiling for this number is actually way beyond what most people actually think it is. People think like, oh, if I do... I train an hour every day, six days a week. Like that's, that's me. I'm going to reach that number. And, you know, I'm, I can't burn more calories, you know, like doing exercise is not good for fat loss as a result. And that's not really the case. Um, the reason it's constrained, well, there's a few hypotheses, hypothesis around why it's constrained. One of the most compelling ones is that there's a limit to the amount that you can just digest in a given day. So it's related to like your kind of basal metabolic rate, your digestibility of nutrients or whatever. And um, like your mitochondria, for example, have a capacity, they can't exceed that in a given day. They just, there's not as enough of them. And um, so it is constrained at the top end. So if you do more activity, you will actually start eating into, so if you do more eat using the same terminology, you will actually eat into other components of metabolism, namely your BM or but the one that really seems to be impacted is just your neat. So Gary, you go out and you burn 2000 calories in a morning session. Let's say you do swimming because swimming is a really high calorie expenditure uh, event, especially if the, the pool is cold. <laughs> um, like you burn a fuck ton of calories doing that, right? And then you come back out and you go, I'm just going to sit around for the rest of the day. I'm tired. I burnt through a load of calories. And that's what happens, right? And that's what really gets eaten into a lot. Now we can control for this to some extent by just tracking our steps, right? So while uh, energy is constrained or metabolism is constrained, a lot of this in terms of the real world, the practical setting, you just control it by making sure your steps, your step count is in a good place. However, if you are an athlete who's training maybe 40 hours a week, like 
tracking your steps is probably not going to make or break the program here, right? It's not going to be the one that's like, oh, whatever, my metabolism is now fixed. It's exactly where I want. Like you're probably just training too much, right? There's a limit to how much you can expend, right? But for the average everyday person that's maybe doing like 5,000 steps, has a desk job and, you know, trains four times a week, thinking about a constrained energy metabolism, it really doesn't help. <laughs> it, it just doesn't apply to you in general. And anything that it does apply to you can just be completely ameliorated by just tracking your daily steps, at least in my opinion. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Gary. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that the, the advice that I normally give people, if they're you know generally working a sedentary job or they feel more lazy and tired when they're dieting and they don't want to drop calories, is to get their steps up. And normally what I say is, you know, 10 to 15,000 is like a practical range. Like for people working sedentary jobs, it might be 6,000 or so. But I'm rarely telling people to just keep going higher, like 20, 25, 30,000 steps. It's just, there's practical limitations. And it's also the case that you again run into that issue that you're walking so much that you're just wrecked otherwise and you don't have much energy for anything else. So that's kind of the practical takeaway is that you can't control the rate of adaptation. You can't will your way to different sex hormones or metabolic hormones, but what you can control is how much you exercise, how much you eat and how active you are outside of exercise, i.e. how much you're walking. 100%. Anyway, Gary, I'm aware that you have to uh, get moving. So uh, do you want to wrap this up? Yeah. So as always, guys, if you'd like to get more personalized advice, coaching with us, we do have coaching spaces available information in the description box below if you'd like to just follow along with more of our content we've got the triage newsletter you can sign up to and you can also follow us on social media we do also have a nutrition certification that coaches can join or want to be nutritionists so maybe you're a trainee that's thinking of taking your knowledge up a level or you want to start actually coaching people in nutrition you can join our nutrition cert and get that knowledge and those skills so the podcast as well obviously we're going to be continuing to put out this podcast every single week we always appreciate feedback we appreciate reviews and shares etc so continue to do that and uh, that's everything from us 100 anyway we'll see you in the next one guys goodbye